a lot of organizations, companies, you know, they, they have a bookkeeper, they have somebody in place that is doing their accounting and they may be looking at the accounting as, you know, I got to make sure that I pay my bills on time. I got to make sure that, you know, I get invoicing out to, to donors or I get, make sure I got cash coming into the door. Got to make sure we file our, our annual 990 or our tax returns at the end of the year. And that's about it. And so as these organizations grow, they start to realize that the importance level and having good financials becomes more and more critical. Hello, I'm Justin Wheeler, and welcome to this episode of Nonstop Nonprofit. Money, budgets, funding, accounting. All nonprofits know how important these are to the success of programming and impact. But when you're a smaller nonprofit or just starting out, do you really need a CFO? Today's guest, Jason Kruger, has experience with a novel arrangement that's allowing nonprofits to start from the ground up, building an accounting team and processes that fit instead of skipping a grade before you're ready. As president and founder of Signature Analytics, Jason brings financial knowledge specific to nonprofits, like audit requirements, the benefit of transparency, and best of all, a healthy respect for getting it all done on time. And as customers of Signature Analytics ourselves, Fundraise is excited to assist our nonprofit friends in tackling accounting wherever you're at. Listen in to get clarity on how properly fitted accounting contributes to the success of your impact, where to start, and pitfalls to avoid, and signals that'll tell you it's time to professionalize your finance functions. Let's dive in. It is your number one priority to ensure your business can continue to deliver on its mission, whether it's this year, next year, and beyond. So we're creating this inclusive environment, building between diverse communities to ensure that our young people can thrive. I'm always so baffled when I when I do webinars. There's always somebody at the end who raises their hand and says, I'm the development director. Should I have access to the budget? I'm always like, yes, you've got to know that. The best thing you can ever do as a nonprofit leader is spend as much money as possible on your story. Then you're doing it wrong. Okay. That is unacceptable and that is not the way to run a board. The best thing that we can do is just raise as much money as possible and then give it to the people around the world. If you're going to be sustainable, you have to have a multi-channel strategy to reach all of these different generations of donors however they want to be reached. One of the principal values that we carry as an organization is to lift grace over guilt. And we believe that grace is the greatest agent for change that anyone can ever experience. We all need each other in terms of other nonprofits working together to solve things. The more nonprofits can give their donor base that experience of the impact that's being made on the ground level, there's nothing else you have to give someone. This is Nonstop Nonprofit. Jason, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks, Justin. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, to digging in. For those listening, Jason is the founder and president of Signature Analytics, which I'm going to let him explain exactly what Signature does. And before we do that, before we jump into the business, I'd love to, if you could spend a minute or so just telling the listeners, sharing with the listeners a little bit about yourself, your background, and how that intersects with the nonprofit industry. Yeah, absolutely. So personal side, I'll keep it short. Married, have three girls, 11, 9, and 6. So I'm in the thick of it, as you can imagine. Yep. If any listeners have advice, you know, once they get in the teenage years, I'm open to it. <laughs> From a business perspective, I started my career in public accounting. So obviously, a lot of the conversation we're going to be talking about is, is accounting and finance around nonprofits. Started with a firm called Moss Adams, which is a large national firm, and then went to Deloitte, which is a, one of the large big four global firms, and uh, worked with an, a lot of different industries. But I also had a, a pretty strong experience and got a lot of good visibility into non, the nonprofit community as well. So I was on the nonprofit team uh, at Deloitte that supported some of the nonprofits that we worked with. Same thing with Moss Adams. So I got, I got some pretty good exposure to the nonprofit community. Spent about close to nine, 10 years in public accounting and decided to leverage my background and start Signature Analytics at that time, which was in October of 2008. So if you remember the time, it was a little crazy going on at that time. I think I you know, the economy was falling apart. And the good thing was I didn't have an employee, any employees or any costs at that time, really. So I was taking a risk by leaving my salary behind. I had a very understanding wife, of course, and uh, decided to make that leap of faith. And so 
basically what Signature Analytics does is it works with both for-profit and nonprofit organizations, although the nonprofit space is probably our largest vertical if you look at different industry or organizational verticals that really deserve better as it relates to the accounting and, and financial side of their business. And what I mean by that is a lot of organizations, companies, you know, they, they have a bookkeeper, they have somebody in place that is doing their accounting and they may be looking at the accounting as, you know, I got to make sure that I uh, pay my bills on time. I got to make sure that, you know, I get invoicing out to, to donors or I get, make sure I got cash coming into the door. Got to make sure we file our, our annual 990 or our tax returns at the end of the year. And that's about it. And so as these organizations grow, they start to realize that the importance level and having good financials becomes more and more critical to making decisions, but also to talking to outside parties, which may include the board, may include a bank. Obviously, they're going to have audited financial statements. They're going to have donors looking at those financial statements for credibility purposes. They might be getting grants uh, into the future. And so a lot of that comes into play and they need that sophistication. And what our role is, is is saying, okay, how do we take the accounting and financial arm as a G&A cost for organizations that, you know, initially they, they want to reduce costs at all, you know, not, not really do much with to making it a value add to the organization through providing clarity through programs and program expenses, budgets, et cetera. So um, that's really our focus and how we do that is on a fractional basis. And so we want to make sure we have the best, the best talent and bring that best talent to the nonprofit space. We have a fully dedicated team that that we that supports our clients, and we do a really good job of bringing that top talent in a way that uh, organizations couldn't or, ordinarily afford. And uh, let's be honest, most of those organizations don't need a full time CFO. They don't need a full time controller, but they need that leadership. They need financial leadership. They need accounting leadership to help them to continue their growth and make sure that they're meeting expectations from a compliance perspective as well. Got it. And just to, as a as a side note for our listeners, uh, Fundraise uh, is a part of the for-profit vertical of Signature Analytics customer base. And, you know, just to speak to the value add and partnership approach that Signature takes, it truly is a partnership. You know, there's there's two types of vendors that you can work with, ones that are just trying to clock in as many hours as possible and not be highly strategic. Uh, and then there are others who are what I would say are more entrepreneurial focused and willing to be in the trenches and work alongside in a way that adds a ton of value. And that's been our experience over the last six months. And I know that you know what's what's interesting is within your nonprofit aspect of of, of the business, you're working with organizations kind of of, of varying degrees of of scale. And so when you when you think about like the stakeholders of good accounting, right, whether that's the board, like you mentioned, a bank, the executive team, what do you think are some of the key drivers specifically for the executive team at a nonprofit on why accounting should be prioritized before it becomes a problem or before it becomes, you know, harder to deal with if that makes yeah, sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think with a nonprofit organization, it always starts with the budget, right? So every year there's an annually annual budgeting process. And the organization, um, if they're doing it well, is taking a deep dive into what that looks like. So you have the expense side, you have the different programs, you have the program leaders, everybody's getting involved with that. You also have on the revenue side, you have your, you know, the, the fundraising team, you have a, an under, you, you're really digging deep, hopefully, and you're understanding of who your donors are. If you have grants, you're wanting to understand that process. So really developing that budget the foundation of how a, how a nonprofit operates and how a nonprofit evaluates itself throughout the year is based on that budget that they set. So that process is critical. And so as organizations be, grow, that becomes more and more critical because at the beginning, maybe it's just the executive team that's looking at it and they're saying, okay, yeah, you know, maybe it's, you know, maybe we'll get this, maybe we'll get that. But as they grow, as you mentioned, that budget then needs to be shared with the board of directors in a lot of cases or the finance committee. And so that's critical. And they make decisions on a monthly basis based off that budget. And so if you don't have a grasp of what your budget is, then you start making potentially decisions that are impacting the success of the overall organization. And so that's a critical component is the budgeting aspect and making sure you have a good process to produce a good budget that, that will drive your organization forward. 
if an organization is just saying, well, we did 10 million last year, so we're going to add 10% this year without any underlying data as to the why behind it, then you could be setting yourself up for some challenging times if you don't hit that. And so, so that's, that's critical. The other piece that's really important for the executive team is being able to break down that budget into different areas. So how are they really looking at the data and analyzing that data based on maybe different departments? And so some of the things that we've done for our clients is the program heads want real-time information as quickly as, as possible. They don't want to be waiting 30 or 60 or you know, 90 days to be getting historical information on where they are against their budget and how, how the performance of their programs is happening. And so what we've been able to do for a number of our clients is take that information and get them that real-time data that gets sent to them automatically on a real-time basis, on a weekly basis, or in some cases daily, if we can tie into their accounting system. And so that gives them that real visibility there. And then the last piece is, you know, once a company in California at least gets over $2 million, or an organization gets over $2 million, they're required to have audited financial statements. And so that process can be a very challenging process if you don't have a good financial acumen or a good financial, if you're not producing solid financial information with the appropriate supporting documentation, processes, procedures documented, those types of things. And so all of that then becomes very important to be able to take an organization from you know, one to two million dollar organization to a five million dollar organization or a ten million dollar organization or twenty. And so the larger an organization gets, the more sophisticated they tend to get and the more reliance they make to, you know, on their financial side and the financial arm of their of their organization. And what our job is to do is to educate the smaller organizations as to why that is the case. Why do we have to invest now so that so we can take that next step, so that we can double in size, so we can triple in size. And a lot of that is just that sophistication and that education around that. Absolutely. So when you think about, uh, and maybe you could share this through the lens of, of your, the size of your, your clients, mm-hmm. what I'm interested in sort of you dissecting is kind of like, what does a healthy financial team look like for a nonprofit, yep. right? And, and you know, whether it's, whether it's internal or outsourced, when you think of organizations that are starting to hit some scale, yep. you have all sorts of like functions in, in finance from accounting to FP&A to, yep. you know, more strategic at the CFO level. And so just be curious to hear sort of like, what is the ideal makeup of a, of a finance team for a mid-sized yep. nonprofit? I'm glad you asked that question because a lot of times what the management team is told by the board is, hey, you have to get a CFO, right? And a CFO solves all, right? And so, so a lot of these organizations, they don't have a lot of sophistication at the lower levels. And now they're saying, well, I got to hire a CFO and they'll just take care of everything. And you know, we're, we're off to the races and I don't have to worry about finance anymore. And, and the reality is one of two things happens. You either hire a, someone and, and you give them a CFO title and they don't really have that sophistication of what, you know, what we would consider a true CFO would be. And so now you're having them do some of the lower level accounting. Maybe they're taking care of the books or closing the books. And maybe they can speak to the board or the audit committee or the finance committee or the executive team. But it's still more of a about historical. It's more about the numbers, and there's just really a lack of just not that sophistication of that high-powered CFO. The other side of the coin is maybe you spend a little bit more, and you do get that high-powered CFO. The best use of that person's time is not going to be doing bank recs, closing the books, and so forth. And so what what we what we recommend in most cases is making sure that we recommend starting from the ground up. So if you're going to hire a full-time resource. We recommend that being at the lowest level first. You need somebody that can do the data entry, the transactional work, make sure that that person is in place and can get things done. And then you need to build off of that person. So then you can start bringing in, uh, depending on your size, no matter what your size, you need somebody that can provide some level of oversight to that lower level person because they are, they're lower level. They don't have the sophistication. As that person grows, maybe you hire somebody else at a full-time level above that lowest level person. And then ultimately you get to a point where you have a controller and then ultimately a CFO. So the standard is you started listing them out. You have a CFO, you have a controller, maybe you have a county manager and a senior accountant, and then you have a staff level below that. That would be your standard hierarchy. Where you started to go off to the side a little bit is, you know, FP&A, 
which is financial planning and analysis. So that's really more about taking the numbers and getting and driving better reporting. So now you're starting to look ahead in your business, right? You have a VP of finance, which is more of a finance mindset, maybe not quite the CFO level, but a finance mindset. And so how we like to, to recommend structuring an organization is make sure you can get the blocking and tackling done at the lowest level, but make sure that you have the oversight and processes to ensure that you're getting that accurate, relevant, and timely information. So that's where, you know, I'm very biased, but that's where our model comes in, right? Which is, yes, you may have someone at the lowest level, but provide them that leadership, provide them that support without having to hire a full-time person, provide them that support to make sure that they're getting, that you have confidence in the accounting department and in the finance function. As you grow, you can start building that out. You, you know, when you're a 200 million, 300 million, 400 million nonprofit, you probably have a full team. You don't need a fractional person at each level, but when you're smaller, it's more cost effective. It's more efficient to break that down in that way. Makes sense. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And as a follow-up, do you have any sense of how important it is to the donor for a nonprofit to have clean books, strong accounting, uh, and, and financial reporting? Like, have you, have you guys done any work there to understand sort of the mindset of the donor and, and why that's, that could be important or is it maybe not as important from your perspective? Yeah, it's critical. I mean, the, from a, what your accounting and financial information does is it it it, adds, it gives the credibility and the security to a donor when they are going to make a contribution. So if an organization is one or two or three, we've seen three or four years behind in, in finalizing their audits, that's public knowledge. Any donor can see that. And if they want to ensure that if they're going to be giving you know, money or funds to an organization that's being taken care of and accounted for appropriately, and if they see that you know, they're behind on the audit or uh, they're not able to get good financial information. There's nobody within the organization that can speak to the numbers. It's definitely a red flag and create, can create some challenges. I did hear more recently that I think now is one of the first times ever where I think there was a study done and I, I'll have to find it after the call, after we, we get off, but where in people or individuals trust nonprofit organizations less now than they do for-profit businesses. And the reason behind that is because, and I heard an example last week, actually, where bringing in a high-powered donor and uh, they say, well, I don't trust nonprofits. And they say, why don't you trust nonprofits? And he says, because I don't know where the money's going, right? If I'm going to give you my, my you know, hard-earned dollars, I want to make sure I understand where the money's going. And that is, you know, why, I mean, that just adds to, if you can show that donor Hey, here's where your money's going. Here's our programs. Here's how we account for it. Here's the here's what we're doing. Here's all the good we're doing with that. And not just the good, but how that then relates to the cost and the impact and everything else that we're doing adds tremendous credibility and allows organizations to continue to grow, which is why as they do grow and the ones that do are able to be successful, you see that they've created that sophistication in their finance and accounting function. Yeah, I think that that's a that's a really great example. And now, enjoy this break from your friends at Fundraise, the nonprofit industry's most innovative fundraising platform. Fundraise provides exceptional, innovative, and friendly fundraising technology focused on nonprofit growth. Made for fundraisers by fundraisers, our state-of-the-art platform integrates every core aspect of front and back-end fundraising management into a convergent platform perfect for nonprofiteers like you. Every day, we celebrate nonprofits like UNHCR and National Wildlife Federation as they trust fundraise to power fundraising campaigns around the world. Warning, we go through a lot of confetti. Get started raising the funds and the fun at fundraise.org. That's F-U-N-R-A-I-S-E dot O-R-G. Now that you've heard how fundraise can level up your fundraising game, Let's get back to the conversation. When you think about that big question from the donor, where is the money going? There's the accounting aspect to it. And then there's also, well, what's like the communication aspect, yep. right? And 
what you see too much, I think, in the nonprofit industry is sort of just this disconnect mm-hmm. from the PL to the fundraising yep. teams. And, you know, the fundraising teams are told we do X, Y, and Z a year, look at our impact, but they don't own the PL right. or the categories of the PL that they really should own as, as the fundraiser. Yep. So I think that like bridging those two things is incredibly important, will ultimately hopefully yield, you know, more transparency to to the donor yep. and those interested in in supporting a nonprofit. Yeah. And, you know, if a lot of donors or, you know, a lot of less sophisticated donors will say, well, I want hundred percent of my money to go to the programs, right? And the impact. Well, for better or worse, you know, if that's the case, you can't run an organization, right? And so a lot of sophisticated donors will say, hey, I want I want to actually understand that you I want to make sure you are investing in your infrastructure. It's not exciting, but you ha- you've got to create an infrastructure to support the mission of what you're trying to accomplish. Otherwise, what I'm giving you is is going to be very, ine- you're going to spend it very inefficiently, right? And they say, hey, I want you to bring in fundraise. You need fundraise. You need a fundraising platform, right? Why, why don't you have fundraise? Um, or you need better, you know, you need to make sure that you're managing and able to get the right financial reporting that also supports and shows that we're making progress in the mission of the organization. And so that, I mean, it's critical. You don't want to over, you don't want to, you know, have a too high sg a costs, but at the same time, it can't be zero or even, you know, one or 2% either. You have to have the right mix to be able to yeah. really move forward. And it's not bad to promote that even to donors. Hey, look at what we're doing to invest in our, in our infrastructure to take us from where we are now to where we're going to be. And a lot of times the donors mm-hmm. respect that and, and they're excited about that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's if you put on sort of like your investor hat and you're like, if I'm going to invest in this thing, I'm going to make sure that it has the potential to be around in three, five, 10 years mm-hmm. from now to accomplish what I invested right. in. You know, same from the donor's perspective is like, if they see a 100% volunteer run organization, is that organization going to be able to scale and, you know, be able to achieve its big mission and vision? I don't know. Yeah. Probably not. It'd be very, very challenging. And so that actually like leads me to the, this next question of how, like how much of an objection is it in your conversations with prospective clients mm-hmm. uh, when they're thinking about maybe the cost of, of hiring, you know, an agency like Signature, yep. how much of the time is it, is it like, do you, do you see the internal conflict of like, oh, this is a GNA cost. This is not a program cost. This is going to, you know, this is going to bring our overhead up a couple points, whatever it might yep. be. How often do you see that dialogue kind of play out, whether in conversation with you, or you can tell it's an objection that you have to get the, the prospective customer, you know, comfortable with and, and how do you educate yeah. them there? So to your point, a lot, you know, a lot of it is education and also for better or worse, a lot of times we get in front of, or we're referred, or we have a, a potential client uh, speak with us because they've experienced the pain points, right? So they go, tried to go the cheap route. Or they tried to go one route and it didn't work out and they tried it again and it didn't work out. Now they're really feeling the pain. And so now they're, they're willing to actually make that investment to, to actually make some real change and to be able to move forward. And I think a lot of times it takes that. Nobody's going to prioritize accounting if they're not having a, a true pain point at that moment, right? Everybody's busy. Everybody has, you know, a hundred different things they're trying to do that day. Um, so, so in most cases, there's got to be some level of pain point. Now, I would love for everybody to be super proactive in their organization and say, you got to set this up for success, but the reality is there's got to be a pain. So for better or worse, when we come in, a lot of times they've experienced that pain and we start to talk through, okay, what were the decisions that you made? How did you get to this pain point? And then start educating them as to, okay, the, you know, helping them understand why, why they are where they are and helping them understand how they can rectify that and then develop a plan on how they're going to move forward now and then into the future to achieve the, the goals and the mission of the organization. From a cost perspective, a lot of times it does come down to the budget too, right? It's like, well, I got to get approval or I got to talk to the board. We're talking to one organization right now that is, you know, they're, they're talking to their board about it. Well, let's put it this way. They're, they're finalizing the audit from over a year ago right now. So they've fallen behind there. They're four or five months behind on closing the books. And now they're, you know, they're trying to, they're educating the, the board. And, and a lot of times in some cases, we'll actually go back and we'll, we'll meet with the board as well and help them to understand, oh, hey, here's where the, the challenges have been. Here's what we've seen in the industry has been successful. Here's what we feel the plan out of that is. And to your point earlier about 
you know, us working with you, our, our goal is to develop a long-term relationship with the organizations that we work with. And we know that cost is an important component of that. And we want to establish the right expectations with cost. And we are incentivized to bring our costs down uh, and create efficiencies. Because if we come in there and just stick it to them in the first month or two, get a few extra bucks, they're not going to want to be our client very long, uh, obviously. And we know that there's parameters of this is a nonprofit. We have to show the value in what we're doing. How is it, how is it driving and how is it contributing to the success of the organization? What is the value that the board and the finance committee is getting out of this? And so that piece is very critical. So we're always working with cost. We're always making sure that we're, we're aligned with them on what that cost structure looks like. And, you know, and the reality is there are some baseline metrics, right? If you're under 3% of combination of accounting, finance, HR is under 3% of your organization's you know, revenue uh, or budget, you probably are understaffed and probably should look at, okay, what, what do I need to be doing so that I can set myself up for success moving forward? Got it. Thank you for that. And as, as a, a follow-up, somewhat uh, related, are there like common pitfalls that you've observed as you get into working with clients? You, you mentioned like a lot of times it's coming when someone has like a, a pain mm-hmm. point. Uh, and so like where that takes me is, okay, what, what's a signal that can maybe be like where nonprofits can be a little bit more proactive so they don't have to get, you know, to maybe a certain threshold yeah. of pain before they c- come to you guys. So any like sort of signals or action items that you could say like, this is what we see. And if you're experiencing this or, a, you know, a degree of, of this experience, now is probably a good time for you to, to think about professionalizing you know, your finance function. Yep. Any, any sort of like trends that, that you could share that yeah. would be helpful for listeners? A lot of organizations have challenges when they are growing and they're, they have rel- full reliance on one person to do all the accounting, right? So two things can happen. One is the person can handle the responsibilities when they're smaller. And as they, the organization grows, this, the level of sophistication maybe outgrows their skill set. So that's one. And so then they, 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 lose, they don't have the experience to be able to maintain and keep up in the right way. The other challenge is if that person leaves, all of a sudden you have nobody that understands anything that's going on with the accounting and finance. So all of a sudden it's like, oh, no. And what ends up to, to add a double, neg- double negative there is a lot of times that person that was there when you were smaller, now you're growing. They start to kind of like, like I just mentioned, they start to struggle a little bit. And so they know they're struggling. And so then they leave. Right. And then now things are behind. You realize, oh, man, we haven't closed the books in three or four months where we can't get through the audit. Now we don't have anybody. And so that's where making sure you have that added layer of support at any organization, even if it's not us, there are other, you know, potentially maybe it's another consultant, maybe it's a board member, maybe it's somebody that can add some layer of support and understand what's really happening. So if somebody does leave, that at least you have some level of coverage. The other thing is make sure that the SOPs, the standard operating procedures, how things are done. If, the, if you can get your, your internal team to document how they do things, it's so much easier if they leave and somebody else comes in, now they can reduplicate those efforts. But a lot of times those aren't mm-hmm. documented at all. So now somebody left and it's like, well, I don't even know where they were getting this information from. I don't know how, how they got this. I don't know what's going on over here. So those are some significant challenges. And the other piece, which is the area that you guys are in, is in software, right? So as, as an organization grows, you know, maybe before at the beginning, they were using QuickBooks and they were using Excel spreadsheets to track their donor base, right? Well, now you have QuickBooks. And then now you may have a separate CRM, like a Salesforce, and then you bring in a fundraise. And now you have three different systems. How are they all working together? How are you able to get the information effectively and efficiently? So those are also can present some challenges. If you're an organization, you're looking to grow and you're, and you're having challenges with your current systems, or you're looking to bring on fundraiser, you're looking to bring on a Salesforce, or, or you're looking to change accounting systems even, let's make sure, if, number one, you have the sophistication internally within your team be able to support that transition because we see a lot of challenges during technology transitions that quite honestly make things worse than they were before. And I'm sure you see that more than I do with challenges associated with you know transitioning. And you guys have a fantastic process to onboard your clients very quickly, but I'm sure you've seen 
how they're integrating their systems and all that different thing. Yeah, no, that's a good. That's a really good point. Are there sort of like deal breakers for you when you're thinking about onboarding new clients? And, you know, part of that onboarding is assessing mm. the tech stack that they're using, yeah. all the different systems. Yeah. What makes it really hard? Uh, what makes it harder for, for your team and, and therefore like any accounting team really to work with a, a, a client when, you know, what are like some of the maybe like the, just like the, the showstoppers for you? Like, met, like you know, not, not, I'm not saying like a specific platform or anything like that, but just like what the lack of communication between platforms, what, any examples that you could share that make accounting the job of accounting really hard to do if your technology doesn't do X. Yeah. So on the technology side, again, as I mentioned before, a lot of times we come in because the integration didn't work the first time or the second time. Right. And so now they're saying, oh man, you know, now I'm trying to, we can't get any information. And so uh, from a technology perspective, I don't think there's any showstoppers where we said, Hey, you know, we can't help you out now. If yeah. we need to bring in the ex- experts, like we're not an expert in fundraise. We're not, we can't customize fundraise for our clients, right? We know that you guys could do that. So if we need to bring in the expert with, you know, of the platform that they're working with, then we'll do that. QuickBooks is pretty, pretty straightforward. I mean, we pretty much are the expert, right? But if you get to a more advanced ERP system, And there needs to be some customizations to actually make it work right. We will work with and help them help, you know, bring in the experts from a customization perspective. But what needs to happen is there needs to be that leadership on the on the organization side that understands how things should really be structured and set up and the what they call the business requirements of the systems. And that's Mm -hmm. the expertise that we bring to the table. And so a lot of times the organization doesn't have the sophistication to really understand how it should be working for that organization in the first place. And so they rely too heavily on the ERP implementer who doesn't know their organization and just says, oh, yeah, yeah, this should work. This is fine. Just do it this way. And then they realize that it actually isn't set up to, to maximize success for them. And now the team starts using Excel spreadsheets on the side, you know, and now all of a sudden you're like, okay, why do we even pay for this when we're still doing stuff on the side over here, right? So yeah. that's where we see challenges. And then also with the integration of data between systems, we do have a technology team that can support some of that. But once it gets to above a level where there needs to be a level of sophistication or, or customization, we know our limits, but we also know that we can bring in the experts as needed too. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, Jason, thank you so much for, for your time today. For those listening, please do check out in the show notes, there'll be a link uh, directly to Signature Analytics to learn more about their services. And again, as a customer for six months, we are very happy customers and willing for anyone listening to uh, be a reference if you're looking for this type of service. I would highly recommend uh, Jason and the Signature Analytics team to those of you listening. And so Jason, again, thank you so much for, for your time today. I look forward to continuing to dig in and build out a truly meaningful partnership for Uh, the nonprofit community that we both serve. Have a great day. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Justin. Thanks for listening to this episode of Nonstop Nonprofit. This podcast is brought to you by your friends at Fundraise, nonprofit fundraising software built by nonprofit people. If you'd like to continue the conversation, find me on LinkedIn or text me at 562-242-8160. And don't forget to get your next episode the second it hits the internets. Go to nonstopnonprofitpodcast.com and sign up for email notifications today. See you next time.